True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Welcome to True Gay Crime. I'm your host, Patrick Morano. And on today's episode, we're going to look at Ronald Dominique, a.k.a. the Bayou Strangler from Louisiana. He was a rapist turned murderer who killed his victims to avoid jail time. We are going to start the story of Ronald J. Dominique, a.k.a. the Bayou Strangler, a.k.a. the Bayou Serial Killer. It's the story of an unassuming man who preyed on the vulnerable and desperate men around him. The night of August 25th, 1996, in Houma, Louisiana, was the end of summer and an especially humid night in the trailer park. There was no wind, and the only sound that could be heard was the cicadas singing loudly in the darkness. Suddenly, interrupting the song was the sound of a trailer window crashing to the ground and a man scrambling desperately to get out. He pulled himself through the opening and dropped down to the ground. Naked, except for an old pair of jeans and a black electric cord tied around his arm, the barefooted man ran around the trailer park yelling, Help! Help me! He's trying to rape me! He's trying to kill me! Neighbors and nearby campers and trailers peered out from behind the safety of their curtains, but no one bothered to help the man. After all, the trailer he jumped out of belonged to Ronald Dominic, the local gay. And this was probably some weird, kinky, gay sex thing. Best not to get involved. They checked that their doors were locked, pulled the curtains tight, and ignored the pleas for help. But the man did get help from the police, and Dominic was arrested on forcible rape charges and booked on $100,000 bond. However, when Dominic was arrested and brought to trial, the victim was nowhere to be found to testify against him. Homeless and a drug user, there was no way to find him. Ultimately, the case was dropped, but only after Dominic spent three months in jail, where he realized he had a problem. The attempted rape gave him a sense of power and control that he was now addicted to and wanted more of. Problem was, he detested prison. It was cold and lonely and dangerous, and he decided he would never go back. His time in jail forced Dominic to reevaluate his technique. That was the turning point, said Sheriff Larpenter. He didn't want to leave any more live victims. A dead man can't talk. Ronald Joseph Dominic was born in 1964 and spent most of his childhood in a small, rundown trailer park in the close-knit bayou community of Thibodeau, Louisiana. Thibodeau sits between New Orleans and Baton Rouge and is the type of place where everyone knows everyone's business. Neighbors would stop by unannounced for a social visit, children played hide-and-seek between the parked campers, and cats and dogs could be seen taunting each other. It was a poor place, but it was a happy place. Dominic attended Thibodeau High School, where he was in the glee club and sang in the chorus. He loved to perform, and only felt happy with himself when he was singing. He was a short man, overweight, with mannerisms that alerted to his classmates that he may be different than them. They picked up on this gayness, and cruel as kids are, they ridiculed him about being homosexual. The teasing and taunting made him withdraw more inside himself and uncomfortable with his sexuality. He decided not to come out as gay, better not to confirm what everyone was already saying. As he got older and into adulthood, he seemed to live in two different worlds. During the day in the trailer park, he was known for his generosity and was often seen helping the residents of his community With yard work or groceries, he would smile, open doors, play with local kids, and was generally a good neighbor. At night, he lived his true self under the cover of darkness. He'd sneak out when everyone was tucked away and spent his nights in drag, moonlighting as Patti LaBelle at the local gay bar. Although his wig was cheap and his impersonation questionable, like the glee club before it, drag made him happy to be alive. But no matter how hard he tried, the local gays thought of Dominic as off-putting and uncomfortable to be around. Because he didn't fit into a world he so desperately admired, and because he wanted to be a part of it, any hope of being a well-adjusted, friendly person was quickly disappearing. He didn't fit the gay mold of the Abercrombie model, 
He didn't have any money, he didn't have any prospects, and he had a poor education. Life had dealt him a hand he couldn't escape from, and he felt powerless and small. He was a soft, overweight man in poor health, standing at just five foot five, who lived with his sister and walked with a cane. Through most of his adulthood, Dominic struggled financially, having difficulty keeping any job for any period of time. He sometimes worked in the area doing odd jobs like delivering pizza and reading meters for utility companies, but he never stayed employed for long because of attitude problems. He would end up living with his mother or other relatives when he couldn't pay his rent. Without much to lose, Dominic took chances with the law. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't very good at getting away with it, and he racked up a slew of charges, including, on June 12, 1985, he was arrested and charged with telephone harassment. He pleaded guilty, paid $75 in fines and court costs. On May 15, 1994, he was arrested and charged with driving while intoxicated and speeding. On August 25, 1996, as we heard earlier at the opening of the story, he was arrested on forcible rape charges. Then, on May 19, 2000, he received a summons to appear in court on disturbing the peace charges. Since it was a misdemeanor, he was able to plead guilty. He paid a fine to avoid appearing in court. February 10th, 2002, he was arrested in Terbonne Parish after he allegedly slapped a woman during a Mardi Gras parade. According to the reports, Dominic accused a woman of hitting a baby stroller in a parking lot with her car, which I guess was true because the woman apologized, but Dominic continued to verbally assault her and then slapped her across the face. He was arrested and entered a parish offenders program instead of standing trial. Despite all of those charges and arrests, Dominic continued to live in a camper in Bayou Blue on property owned by his mother and sister without grief from his loyal neighbors. But these offenses were only building up to something much more sinister and deadly. There was a need growing inside of him. A seed that was planted after the forcible rape of 96 gave him a thirst for more. Dominic behaved just as you'd expect a sexual predator to behave who wants to continue doing what he's doing. He seemed inoffensive, non-threatening, unremarkable, quiet, a seemingly frail man who didn't stand out and was even meek. I mean, what harm could he really do? People who knew him thought he was just an ordinary guy. That's precisely why no one would suspect him. Sexual predators need their victims to trust them, and they want to keep flying under the radar. With a taste for rape and a knowledge that he couldn't leave any evidence behind to incriminate him and send him back to prison, Dominic hatches a new M.O. and lays out his plan. Because he was short, overweight, had health issues, there was no way that Dominic ever hoped to overpower a healthy young man if they went head to head. So, Dominic had to devise a plan of how to get the upper hand on his victims. Step 1. Target the vulnerable. Vulnerable populations are more likely to be in high-risk situations, be desperate for money or substances, be alone, be more open to negotiations and bartering, and would be less likely missed when gone. Step 2. Do your dirty work under the cover of darkness. Dominic prowled the streets of Huma and nearby towns at night, usually between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., looking for men who were alone and either on foot or on a bike. Step 3. Offer them something they want. He was disarming and with a smooth manner and a conversationalist style. Dominic would offer money in exchange for sex with his gay victims and money in exchange for sex with a female with his straight victims. He lured straight men by setting up fake drug deals or showing black men a picture of a woman and telling them that she was willing to pay for sex with a black man. Some of the straight men thought they were about to have sex with Dominic's wife. Although Dominic wasn't married, he told potential victims that he was. And, as part of his ploy, he showed them a photo of an attractive woman claiming her to be his wife. Step 4. Bring them to a secluded place. Once the victims accepted Dominic's offer of money for sex, whether with him or the lie about the woman looking for sex or the lie about a drug deal, Dominic would drive the man to his home, a tiny camper trailer parked beside his sister's mobile home parked on the family's property 
off of Bayou Blue Road, just northeast of Huma. Step 5. Tie them up. Once Dominic got his intended victim back to his trailer, he would tell the man that he had to tie them up first before they had sex. If it was a gay man, it was just part of the ritual that Dominic required and the thing that turned him on. If the victim was heterosexual, Dominic said his wife was shy and wouldn't come into the room until the man was tied up. But I'm thinking, like, first of all, you're in a trailer, so what you, where is she? Like, it's not big. So you've entered through the front door of the trailer and you've brought this man back to the bedroom. I mean, where is she hiding in the toilet? She's shy. Okay. Dominic never fought with his victims because he knew he couldn't overpower them. So he manipulated them, took advantage of their desperation and tricked them into allowing themselves to be put into a helpless position. According to Dominic, there were no drugs involved and every one of the victims voluntarily got tied up. Once they were restrained and tied to the bed, whether gay or straight, Dominic would rape them. Can you imagine the horror and the things that these people must have been yelling and the struggle and the fear? So you're already desperate. You're lured back there. You're, you allow yourself to be tied to the bed. And then you realize at some point that this man is about to take it complete advantage of you. You don't know that you're going to die yet, obviously, but you know that this man is going to rape you now. So they didn't know that they were going to be killed yet, but you know, you do know that this man is about to take full advantage of you and rape you. Imagine the helpless feeling that these guys had being tied to the bed. There's nothing you can do. And these are these are young I mean, they're, most of them were in their 20s. So these are strong, healthy, well, except for the drug use and stuff, but they're, you know, they're young and strong. So they must have, A, must have been tied to the bed real, real tight. And then imagine the, they must have been gagged as well. Because, first of all, he lived in a trailer on his sister's property. So, I mean, where was she? She never heard anything. You know, there was never anything suspicious. Um, obviously, these guys were gagged because can you imagine the obscenities and the the yelling and the screaming? And never mind what they were saying, but the struggle, just the, the powerful struggle that must have gone on for them trying to escape from the restraints that were keeping them down. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not like he tied them to the bed and then they just submitted. They're like, whoop, well, I'm tied to the bed now, you know. The struggle was real, and it must have rocked the trailer. After he raped them, he would strangle or smother them to death. A few victims showed signs of having been beaten up, probably the loudest and the strongest ones, and some were found nude. In his statement to police, Dominic said the men who refused to be tied up would leave his home unharmed. So there were a bunch of guys that even went back to the trailer, but by the time they got back there and Dominic explained about, you know, either with the gay guys, it's his kink, he wants to tie them up, or with the straight guys that his wife was shy and they need to be tied up. A bunch of them came back to the trailer and were like, what do you mean tied up? No, dude, fuck off. No, I'm not being tied up with you, you creep. I'll, I came back here, you know, on a premise of sex or drugs or whatever, prostitution or whatever we're doing, but you're not tying me to your bed. Nice try. So like many serial killers, Dominic targeted his victims, as we mentioned before, from marginalized groups, those that were vulnerable, voiceless, friendless, desperate, those that had fallen between the cracks of society, or those that had never even been given a chance to participate at all. These men were failed by a system that favors white skin and money. Dominic knew these men wouldn't be missed, and so... He took his first victim home with him, a young 19-year-old David Lavron Mitchell. He tied him up and succeeded in both raping and murdering him. Dominic then dragged the body out to the sugarcane field in Hanville, just outside of New Orleans, and left it there. The body of 20-year-old Gary Pierre was found in St. Charles Parish six months later. In July 1998, the body of 38-year-old Larry Ranson was also found in St. Charles Parish. And over the next nine years, bodies of men ranging in age from 17 to 46, most of them, as I mentioned, in their 20s, would be found dumped in sugarcane fields, 
So I Googled a sugarcane field because I'm not from the South. Uh, we can't grow sugarcane here in Canada. And I was curious to see what a sugarcane field looks like. So when I Googled it, it looks like really tall grass. It kind of, it, almost like bamboo slash grass. And it's very tall and it easily goes over your head. So if you have a whole field of sugarcane, it would be very easy to chuck a body in there that wouldn't be found for quite some time. Um, he also put bodies uh, along roadsides and half buried in ditches in remote areas and in desolate bayous. Okay. I also Googled what a bayou is because I have heard the word, I got it. And in my head, it's kind of, I assumed it was kind of like a swampy, wet kind of area, which it kind of is. But I'm going to read what Google to told me so that you get a really clear picture of what a bayou is. A bayou is a slow moving creek or a swampy section of a river or lake. They're usually found in flat areas where the water collects in pools. Bayous are often associated with the south, southeastern part of the United States. Bayous are usually shallow and sometimes heavily wooded. So, yeah, it's basically a pool of non-moving water, which sounds really like that's where gross stuff happens. Like that's where insects and like disease, like when water's not moving and it's just sort of pooled there, that's when disease and stuff happens. So it's kind of gross, but... Uh, many of his victims had addictions to drugs and or alcohol. Some were homeless and had previous arrests, and some were looking to make a quick buck through prostitution. All the St. Charles victims were black men with thin builds who were known to travel by hitchhiking. The last body was found October 15th, 2006. Now, there were similarities in 23 of the murders that led investigators to suspect the men were victims of a serial killer. And so, in 2005, a task force was created to investigate. In the summer of 2005, several law enforcement agencies banded together to form a task force under the overall direction of the Louisiana Attorney General's office. The task force united police and sheriff's deputies from nine South Louisiana parishes. Oh, this is, I googled a parish as well. I knew a parish was like an area, but I wanted to know why, why is it called a parish? So... Instead of counties, Louisiana has parishes. It's the only state in the country with this unique feature. Louisiana was Roman Catholic during both France and Spain's rule of the state. The boundaries or parishes neatly coincided with the state's church parishes. So, little interesting tidbit there for you. Um, so we're talking about the task force, which also included the FBI, the state police, the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office, and the State Division of Probation and Parole. Um, just as the task force was getting underway, southern Louisiana was hit with one of its worst natural disasters. What is it? Mm -hmm. That's the one. In August 2005, Hurricane Katrina tore through the area. She was a Category 5 hurricane, resulting in over 1,800 deaths and, get this, $125 billion of damages. That's a shitload of cash. New Orleans and the surrounding areas were underwater, and it wasn't an... And as if that wasn't enough, are you ready? The next month, Hurricane Rita made an appearance and was the most intense tropical cyclone on record in the Gulf of Mexico and the fourth most intense Atlantic hurricane ever recorded. That's what I mean. Like, they can't catch a break. It's just one after another. <sighs> The area was wrecked, homes were destroyed, people were missing, the country was shocked, and the rescue and cleanup would take months. Needless to say, the task force got sidetracked during this time, but when the water receded and as cleanup continued, the sheriff's office flew in Michael Baden to help continue with the investigation into the murdered men. Baden was the chief forensic pathologist of the New York State Police and host of the HBO TV documentary Autopsy. And he was to examine the body of the second victim. He found evidence that Pierre had been bound before being strangled. And slowly the pieces of their twisted puzzle were coming together. According to Jim Bernazani, the special agent in charge, FBI profilers at the time considered Dominic's case the most significant in terms of the number of victims he had acquired in such a short period of time. So the task force is working... They're picking up clues along the way, but they finally get a big break when an ex-con who was out on parole 
mentioned to his parole officer that he'd met a man who had wanted to tie him up as part of a sexual act with his wife. This raised the red flag to the parole officer who had heard about bodies being discovered in the surrounding area, men who had been tied up, raped, and murdered. This, along with the knowledge of the 96 rape details, the parole officer asked to be taken to the location of the attempted crime. The ex-con couldn't remember the address, but he did lead authorities to the secluded trailer, to the front door of the trailer where Dominic lived. When they arrived, the park was quiet. The task force approached the trailer cautiously, not wanting to, not knowing what to expect on the other side. They knocked once. No answer. They knocked a second time. No answer. They started to wonder if someone was even there or if they were just ignoring them. And what would they find when they opened the door? A third knock. Nothing. It was time to go inside. The task force forcibly opened the door to Dominic's trailer. The trailer was dark and dank as the windows were closed and the curtains were drawn shut. There were unwashed dishes laying around and half-eaten food and a stale smell they couldn't identify. A quick search of the tiny trailer yielded nothing. Dominic was gone, and he had left in a hurry. Little did the police know that Dominic, suspecting the police were onto him and wanting to avoid his family getting involved or witnessing any arrest, had fled the trailer and settled into the bunkhouse homeless shelter in Huma, Louisiana, across town. He wasn't there long, but residents of the home described Dominic as odd. No one suspected he was a killer. And why would they suspect him of being a killer? He was skilled at appearing normal and even helpful with a generous heart. A few months before his arrest, he joined the Lions Club and spent Sunday afternoons calling out bingo numbers to senior citizens. The membership director said he was well-liked by everyone there. But the police quickly tracked him down to the shelter, and he was arrested without incident on December 1st, 2006. Back at the station, Dominic was put in a lineup where the witness ex-con, who had led the police to Dominic's trailer, easily picked him out of the line from the others. Knowing he was caught and that it was the end of the road, Dominic confessed to the rape and murder of at least 23 men over a 10-year period beginning in 1997. In Terrebonne Parish, La Fourche Parish, Iberville Parish, and Jefferson Parish in suburban New Orleans. In his confession, Dominic is reported saying that he frequented area gay bars and targeted men he thought would be willing to have sex for money or could be lured home with the promise of sex with his wife or a drug deal. He voluntarily provided DNA samples which directly connected him to two Jefferson Parish murders. He may have confessed to the crimes, but Dominic is still a sneaky bitch, and he wasn't done playing games. At first, because of his height and lack of strength, he had to outsmart his victims to get them to submit to a vulnerable state, and now he would try to outsmart the police, trying to convince them that his health was failing and that he needed serious care in an institution other than prison. Dominic played the part of a deathly ill heart patient. News photographers captured images of him leaning heavily on a cane as he hobbled into jail surrounded by detectives. Dominic claims to have had two heart attacks in as many months, according to those who knew him, and had recently presented himself as resting on the brink of death. It's all bunk, Sheriff Larpenter said, an act designed to garner sympathy. He went on to say, Dominic has minor heart trouble and is currently receiving medical treatment in jail. And to put things into perspective, the sheriff reminded the public that, just a few months ago, Dominic was lugging around the bodies of men he had raped and murdered. Wearing a baseball cap and a gray fleece hoodie, Dominic appeared in a Terbonne Parish courtroom and listened as the judge set his bond at $8 million. State District Judge George Larkey set up a bond of $1 million for each of the eight murder and rape cases Dominic was formally charged with. Ronald Dominic, now 44 years old, bowed his head as the judge read out the names of eight young men he confessed to raping and killing over a 10-year period in Louisiana. And on September 23, 2008, he was sentenced to eight life sentences. Dominique had pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in a deal to avoid the death penalty. Assistant District Attorney Mark Rhodes said before sentencing, The lives of eight young men were taken from these families by the actions of the defendant. 
I told the families of the victims I was confident we could get a guilty verdict on all eight counts. He knew nothing about them or their families, and he callously killed the victims and left a lifetime of pain as their legacy. When asked about charges for the remaining murders, Dominic's lawyer, Richard Gorley, said, quote, When someone gets sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences, there's no chance of them ever getting out, and any further pursuit of any other charges will be a complete waste of taxpayers' money, end quote. I have a problem with that, though, because, yes, yes, He's charged, he's going to jail, he's not leaving jail, he'll be there forever. He made it, he confessed to first degree murder, so he doesn't get the death penalty, that was the deal, great. What about all of the other victims and their families? What about the closure that the other families would get? You know, it's almost discounting, it's almost like, okay, these eight guys, we've charged him eight times, you know, and and yes, the other, and dot, dot, dot. It's almost like name, 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 wait, eight names. One, two, name, 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 name. And then after that, it's just dot, 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 ETC, right? Like, it just feels like, okay, my son doesn't matter because you caught the man and he's found guilty enough that you're going to put him away forever. Okay, that's nice, but I want my son to have to be acknowledged by the system and for him to, yes, I want you to slap on another life sentence to honor my son. Shit. Dominic is currently incarcerated at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola, which is actually north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So due to the fact that there were so many victims in these crimes and that Dominic um, had so many ties in this tightly knit community, people had a lot to say on the subject. So I feel like it's important to hear from the families of the victims and the shock of those in the community that had trusted this killer. So before the trial began, Veronica Guidry stood outside the sheriff's office waiting to hear any word about the man accused of killing her son, Nicholas T. Nick Pellegrin. 21 years old in 2005. With her was her daughter Jody and Pellegrin's son, four year old Travis. So he had a son, a four year old son lost his dad. Guidry said Dominic's arrest does not ease her pain much. Quote, he took my kid's life from me and I'll never forgive this man. Michael Jones and Juan DeVille were also outside the sheriff's office. Jones was there to get any information about the man who killed his 26-year-old nephew, Anoka Jones, in 2002. DeVille was there for his brother, Chris, 40, who was found dead in 2005. Both men rejected the notion, now this is interesting, this part, because it was widely believed that all of the victims of Dominic were all these transient men that were really hard up and desperate for money or drugs. But listen to this, because um, they said Anoka Jones and Chris DeVille, who were victims, were family men, married with children. Neither of them would have submitted to bondage sex with a man or a woman. And they said that their concerns that there's another killer still at large, maybe an accomplice, who could have helped subdue the victims for Dominic because DeVille said that his brother, who stood at 5'9 and weighed 240 pounds, he said, quote, I know he couldn't take Chris by himself. But Sheriff Larpenter and other investigators are confident that they have the man saying, quote, we didn't stack the deck on him. He, meaning Dominic, stated how, when, and where they were killed. So who knows? I mean, this is up to you to decide if Dominic had an accomplice or not. I mean, Dominic was small in stature, overweight, in poor health, had a cane, and these are young, healthy men that he brought back to his trailer, tied up and raped and murdered. Was there an accomplice, right? Now, these men are saying that, you know, they're, uh, that Anoka Jones and Chris DeVille were family men married with children. Okay, well, that doesn't mean that they're not addicted to drugs. That doesn't mean that they, they're not having gay set paying or getting paid or paying for, you know, gay sex on the side. It doesn't mean those things, but it does sort of set up this idea that, oh, wait, maybe there's more and we didn't uncover it. And we all know that the police just want to wrap it up, right? They're just like, oh, we got our man. Okay, but guilty. And then send him off to prison, right? And, and not have to think about it anymore. 
Uh, members of the victim's families who were in court for the sentencing included Chris Cunningham, who told his brother's killer, quote, I hope he burns in hell, pretty much. I hope the man burns in hell. I'm sure he will. The sister, that was the quote, that wasn't me editorializing at the end. <laughs> um, the sister of victim Chris DeVille, Cynthia Barabin, said, quote, the nature of what he did and how he left my brother's body in a cane field for rodents to eat him. When we found him, he was nothing, nothing. We had to bury bones. Those in the community that interacted with Dominic and knew him on a personal level were shocked. Wayne Beasley, who met Dominic in a Huma bar, uh, Huma gay bar in 1998 and occasionally played pool with a confessed serial killer, said, quote, it's a black eye for the gay community. I've talked to several people who've met him and know him, and he and I got along pretty well. To me, he seemed like an okay guy, but you could tell he was a little off. You could tell that there was something definitely different about him. From what I gather, he was a kind of outcast. He wasn't popular in the gay community. I think he was teased a lot. Beasley said Dominic didn't drink much and apparently was not a drug user and that people in the gay community referred to Dominic as quote-unquote Miss Moped because he had won a moped in a contest from McDonald's and used it to get around. That's such a gay thing to do. Give him a weird nickname like Miss Moped. Dominic was a frequent customer at the local video store for several years. The owner said she knew Dominic was gay. He rented gay porn movies and sometimes talked enthusiastically about dates he'd gone on with other men. He also liked comedies and often rented children's movies for his nieces and nephews. God, I hope he never mixed up the, the children's movies with the gay porn he was renting. The owner said he was a very friendly guy. You, could ask, you couldn't ask for a better guy. A few months ago, wow, she was way off. A few months ago, Dominic surprised the video store owner when he walked in and told her that the police suspected him of being the Huma area serial killer. She said, quote, if you're the serial killer, then I'm the Queen of England. Bad judges of character. Okay. Ronnie Herbert had known Dominic for years. Herbert owns Ronnie's Lounge, which is a bar two blocks away from the homeless shelter where Dominic was arrested. A few years ago, Herbert was dating Dominic's cousin and often saw the man we now know is a serial killer hanging out in his bar. He said, quote, about three or four years ago, he was here just about every weekend. He was quiet. He never really spoke to many people. He never caused no problems. Dominic barely drank, Herbert said. Usually he sipped on sodas and shot pool. It's kind of hard to believe. He didn't seem like that kind of person. They never do, Herbert they never do like what does that mean he didn't seem like that kind of person like so so what is that kind of person hmm? somebody who just walks around with a knife that has blood on it and like a crazed look on their face saying i'm gonna kill you i mean a former neighbor of dominic's who lives across the street from his sister's trailer said dominic was a good neighbor he was nice she said uh dominic played with her children and other children in the small neighborhood she also saw him f playing frequently with his sister's grandchildren. Quote, he's not the person we knew, she said. Again, they rarely are, girl. They rarely are. And so ends the dark, troubled, double life and tragic rapes and murders of Ronald J. Dominic, a.k.a. the Bayou Strangler. Okay, that, my friends... There's a little bit of a mystery going on because I didn't, I mean, I was kind of in the back of my man, uh, mind, I was kind of questioning, well, how is this man getting these men to submit, like, stronger, healthier, younger men to submit to him in this way, or at least, you know, trick them into coming back, but that's what happens when you are desperate, Um that's what you do when you're desperate. You do desperate things. I mean, these people were looking for a buck. They needed help. They, they, anything. And when you're that desperate, you'll fall for anything. So even this man who was, and, and I'm sure Dominic was very, un, obviously unassuming because you see this guy hobble over to you with a cane. You know, you don't think, oh, he's going to kill me and rape me. Um, so, but also, 
it was said that he's a conversationalist and he was disarming and stuff like that. So, you know, add that to your situation, which is desperate. You're looking for food. You're looking for drugs. You need cash. Um, you know, you're living on the streets. That's not a good combination. And Dominic knew that and he was taking advantage. Again, as many, 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 many serial killers do, they take advantage of the vulnerable. So when I was doing research about this, I was thinking about the gay apps. Um, and I was thinking about Bruce MacArthur, who we covered on a previous podcast, and how he was meeting men on the apps. And then it was all about bondage and getting tied up and he would lure them home um, you know, to do BDSM and tie them up and restrain them. And that was all the part of his, his thing. And I know, okay, I got it. I got, I get it. Who do you trust to do that? Who do you trust to tie you up? Not Dominic. I mean, okay. In this example, this is somebody you just met on the street and he's bringing you back to his trailer and said, and want, says he wants to tie you up. That's no, that's a, that's a hard no. Um, but Again, with Bruce MacArthur, he knew some of his victims. They had played many times together, and then one of the times he just decided to kill them. So they had already had a history, a, a trust was built. So it's easy to say, you know, you need to trust somebody or, you know, go with your gut or something. But how do you do that? How do you navigate the, the dangerous world of BDSM? Even the people that you do trust, you think you know somebody. You think you know somebody, and then, ta-da! I think a good rule of thumb, before you get into any kind of play like that, and I and I, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, I bet you a lot of the thrill is the fact that this is a new person, and you don't know them very well, and that adds to the excitement. I think as a rule of thumb, getting to know the person that you're going to be performing these things with is a good idea. I mean, at least it's a step in the right direction. They could still turn on you and kill you, Bruce MacArthur. So all of this is just such risky behavior that I am 100% not judging, by the way, at all. Um, I've done my share of shit. But, you know, it's just fascinating because what is the answer? There is no answer because you're not going to not do these things because this is, this is what you like. This is your thing. And yet, how do you do it safely? Yeah, there's all that. And, you know, this whole thing of like the neighbor saying, oh, he didn't seem like that kind of person. Oh, he's so unassuming. Yeah. I mean, like I said, what does a killer look like? You know, look at Ted. Bu I just um, I finished uh, on Netflix. I watched Ted Bundy. And it's fascinating because it, obviously a very good looking man, extremely charismatic man, well spoken. And they said over and over and over in this sort of docu-series that, you know, nobody could believe it was him. Even when the evidence was pointing in that direction, um, even when they had him, even when he was in court, there were people that were coming to watch um, his trial in court that were there defending him because they just didn't believe, even though with all the evidence and eyewitnesses and victims, hello, victims that survived and got away, testifying and stuff still people were coming to his defense because he was so charming and disarming and handsome and that's so dangerous that in our minds we're so programmed to think that somebody who's well-spoken and charming and good-looking couldn't be a killer um, and in this case of Dominic I mean he wasn't good-looking by any means um, but he was apparently he could talk. He was a conversationalist and extremely disarming, and he just didn't look threatening at all. The moral of the story that we can't seem to learn, I don't know, we just don't learn it, is that you don't know if somebody's a serial killer you or, or any kind of killer or rapist or anything. You just don't know from looking at them or speaking to them. You just don't. They're not going to walk around with like, you know, I don't know, what would a killer look like? Okay, so I'm thinking like um, like dark circles around their eyes uh, because they don't sleep a lot and maybe like bloodshot eyes and then like yellow teeth and then um, holding like a, a bloody knife, I guess. Um, and Oh, and maybe wearing like a jumpsuit or something, uh, a hoodie, 
Um, what else would they be wearing? What would a killer have? Oh, maybe a backpack with like rope and gloves and like <laughs> this is and their hair would be messy. And then I like I'm just trying to construct like what would a serial what would a killer look like? Because we always say, well, oh, my goodness, I never knew. I, I never suspected him. Well, yeah. Why would you? Like, <laughs> unless he told you, hey, mm, I, I like killing people. Also, the point is, you don't have to be polite to people. Um, you, if you, if somebody, okay, let me put it this way. If somebody comes up to you, or if you're chatting to somebody online, or you're having some kind of interaction with somebody, and they are creeping you out, or you feel off, your your spidey sense is tingling, you know, your gut is telling you to run, just run. Just go. Don't worry about being polite. Don't worry. Like with Ted Bundy, for example, these women, he would say, oh, oh I hurt my arm. My arm is in a sling. Can you help me with my car and everything? And then they would have this weird like gut feeling. Well, follow that feeling and run. Don't worry about being rude. We're so conditioned to be polite all the time, to say the right thing and not to offend people and stuff. You know what? Offend them. If your spidey sense is tingling, you run. You don't worry about how they're going to feel about your reaction. Because if you're wrong, you can always apologize later. Or if you never see them again, who cares? Because you'll never see them again. If you do see them again and you were wrong, you can apologize. But who's going to blame you for taking care of yourself and then if you were right and they turn out to be a killer well you survived so you know and I'm also guilty of this where with strangers and stuff I'm just friendly and overly I'll, I'll stop or I'll listen or I'll help and I'll but if you're not feeling good about the situation you don't have to help them you don't have to listen to them you can walk away. You can say no. You don't have to interact with anybody. You don't feel safe around. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you in the next episode of True Gay Crime. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com, and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, Tell someone where you're going and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?